what about AI? Are you worried about AGI, super intelligence systems, or paperclip maximizer type of type of situation? Yes, I'm definitely worried about it, but I feel kind of bipolar in that some days I wake up and I'm like- You're excited about the future? Well, exactly. I'm like, oh, wow, we can unlock the mysteries of the universe, you know, escape the game. Um, and <laughs> This, this, you know, if because I spend all my time thinking about these molecky problems that, you know, what what is the solution to them? What, you know, in some ways you need this like omni benevolent, omniscient, omni wise coordination mechanism that can like make us all not do the 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 molecky thing, uh, or like pr provide the infrastructure or redesign the system so that it's not vulnerable to this molecky process. Um, and in some ways, you know, that's that's the strongest argument to me for like the race to build AGI is mm -hmm. that maybe, you know, we can't survive without it. But the flip side to that is the 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 the, the, the unfortunately now that there's multiple actors trying to build AI, AGI, you know, this is this was fine ten years ago when it was just DeepMind, but then other companies started up and now it created a race dynamic. Now it's like that's a, the whole thing is at the same it's got the same problem. It's like whichever company is the one that like optimizes for speed at the cost of safety will get the competitive advantage. And so we'll be the more likely the ones to build the AGI, you know, and, and that's the same cycle that you're in. And there's no clear solution to that because you can't just go like um, slapping, you know, the, the, if you go and try and like stop all the different companies, then it will, you know, the, the good ones will stop because mm -hmm. they're the ones, you know, within, you know, within the West's reach, but then that leaves all the other ones to continue and then they're even more likely. So it's like, it's, it's a very difficult problem with no clean solution. Um, and, you know, at the same time, you know, I, I know the, at least some of the folks at DeepMind and they're incredible and they're thinking about this. They're very aware of this problem and they're like, you know, I think some of the smartest people on earth. Yeah, the, the, the culture is important there because they are thinking about that and they're some of the best machine learning engineers. So it's possible to have a, a, a company or a community of people that are both great engineers and are thinking about the philosophical topics. Exactly, and importantly, they're also game theorists, right. you know, and because this is ultimately a game theory problem the thing, this, this Moloch mechanism and like, you know, what this rate, how do we voice rate, uh, arms race scenarios? Um, you need people who aren't naive to be thinking about this. And again, like luckily there's a lot of smart, non-naive game theorists within, within that group. Yes, I'm concerned about it. And I, I, I think it's again, a thing that we need people to be thinking about, um, in terms of like, how do we create, how do we mitigate the arms race dynamics and how do we solve the thing of it's got Bostrom calls it the orthogonality problem, whereby because there's obviously there's a chance you know the the belief the, the hope is is that you build something that's super intelligent, and by definition of being super intelligent, it will also become super wise and have the wisdom to know what the right goals are, and hopefully those goals include keeping humanity alive, right? Um, but Bostrom says that actually those two things you know um super intelligence and super wisdom aren't necessarily correlated. They're actually kind of orthogonal things. And how do we make it so that they are correlated? How do we guarantee it? Because we need it to be guaranteed, really, to know that we're doing the, the thing safely. But I think that like um, merging of intelligence and wisdom, the, at least my hope is that this whole process happens sufficiently slowly, that we're constantly having these kinds of debates, th that we have enough time to, um, to figure out how to modify each version of the system as it becomes more and more intelligent. Yes, buying time is is a good thing, definitely. Anything that slows everything down, we just everyone needs to chill out. We've got millennia to figure this out. Yeah. Um, or at least, at least, um, well, it depends. Again, it's, it's some people think that you know we can't even make it through the next few decades without having some kind of om omni wise coordination mechanism. Um, and there's also an argument to that. Yeah, I don't know. Well, there is, uh, I'm suspicious of that kind of thinking because it seems like the entirety of human history is, is uh, has people in it that are like predicting doom uh, or just around the corner. There's something about us that is strangely attracted to that thought. It's It's almost like fun to think about the destruction of everything. Just objectively speaking, I've 
talked and listened to a bunch of people and they are gravitating towards that. It's almost, it's, it's, I think it's the same thing that people love about conspiracy theories is they love to be the person that kind of figured out mm -hmm. some deep fundamental thing about the, that's going to be, it's going to mark something extremely important about the history of human civilization, because then I will be important. Right. When in reality, most of us will be forgotten and 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 and, and, and life will, will go on. I mean, one of the sad things about whenever anything traumatic happens to you, whenever you lose loved ones or just tragedy happens, you realize life goes on. Mm. Even after a nuclear war that will wipe out some large percentage of the population and will torture people for years to come because of the sort of, I mean, the effects of a nuclear winter, people will still survive. Life will still go on. I mean, it depends on the kind of Best. nuclear war, but in, in case of nuclear war, it will still go on. That's one of the amazing things about life. It finds a way. And so in, in that sense, I just, I feel like the doom and gloom thing is a... Um, but what we don't, yeah, we don't want a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, that's exactly. Yes. And I very much agree with that. And I, you know, even I have a slight like eh, feeling from the amount of time we've spent in this conversation talking about this, because it's like, you know, our, is this even a net positive if it's like making everyone feel, oh, in some ways, like making people imagine these bad scenarios can be a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. But at the same time, that's out, the, the, that's weighed off with at least making people aware of the problem and gets them thinking. And I think particularly, you know, the reason why I want to talk about this to your audience is that on average, they're the type of people who gravitate towards these kind of topics because they, they're intellectually curious and mm -hmm. and they can sort of sense that there's trouble brewing. Yeah, They can smell that there's, you know, I think there's a reason that people are thinking about this stuff a lot is because the probability, the probability, for, you know, it's, it's increased in probability over the, certainly over the last few years. Um, trajectories have not gone favorably, let's put it, in, you know, since 2010. So um, it's right, I think, for people to be thinking about it. But that's where they're like, I think, whether it's a useful fiction or whether it's actually true or whatever you want to call it, I think having this faith, this is where faith is valuable because it gives you at least this like anchor of hope. And and I and I'm not just saying it to like trick myself. Like I do truly, I do think there's something out there that wants us to win. Yeah. I think there's something that really wants us to win. And it just, you just have to be like, just like kind of, okay, now I sound really crazy, but like open your heart to it a little bit. Yeah. And it will give you the like, the sort of breathing room with which to marinate on the solutions. We are the ones who have to come up with the solutions, but we can use that there's like there's <laughs> hashtag positivity there's value in that yeah you ha you have to kind of imagine all the destructive trajectories that lay in our future and then believe in the possibility of avoiding those trajectories all while you said audience all while sitting back which is majority the the two people that listen to this are probably sitting on a beach smoking some weed um God just damn it. <laughs> That's a beautiful sunset, or they're looking at just the waves going in and out, and ultimately, there's a kind of deep belief there in um, the the momentum of humanity to figure it all out. We'll make it, but we've got a lot of work to do. Which is ex which? What makes this whole simulation, this video game, kind of fun? This uh, battle of Politopia. I still, man, I love those games so much. That's so good. Uh, and that that one for people who don't know, but uh, Battle of Politopia is a is a big it's like a is this really radical sim simplification of a civilization type of game. It still has a lot of the skill tree development, a lot of the strategy, um, but it's easy enough to play on a phone. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. They've really they've really figured it out. It's it's one of the most elegantly designed games I've ever seen. It's incredibly complex. And yet being, again, it walks that line between complexity and simplicity in this really, really great way. Um, and they use pretty colors that uh, hack the dopamine reward circuits in our brains very well. Yeah, it's fun. I, video games are so fun. Yeah. The, most of this life is just about fun, escaping all the suffering to find the fun.